thank you, and hopefully I could live up to all that. If you're wondering how I went from heart disease to cancer to Alzheimer's, please, if you figure it out, let me know. Um, so I'm going to start with an overview of the NIH SBR program, and I'll flip through anything that Matt showed real quick, but just to orient everyone. And then we'll go into uh, the application to award process. Then I'll focus a little bit on what we're now doing at the NIA. I joined the NIA about three months ago. And then really want to devote much of the time to tips to putting together a competitive application. So I think you know what the NIH SBR program, as Matt mentioned, it's now a total of over a billion dollars um, at the NIH, and at the NIA specifically, it's about a hundred million dollars. Um, Matt showed you the pie chart, and this is an older version, but the NIA, where I am now, National Institute of Aging, now is the fourth largest institute at the NIA, um, and over a hundred million dollars just for small businesses through the SBR and STTR program. 3.2% uh, for SBIR, 0.45% for STTR, those are the congressional mandates that I think many of you know. Um, of course, as you should know, the reason why you're here, it is non-dilutive. Um, hence, we're talking about it at a non-dilutive funding summit. So no repayment, no um, equity, nothing of that sort. You know, really, I think the only cost in getting an NIH award is the time that you really do need to put into it um, to develop a strong application, and that does take time. Um, so in terms of question we always get, SBIR versus STTR, probably the biggest difference is how the money can be allocated, especially at the phase one stage. So for an SBIR, two-thirds of the cost has to be done by the small business, which means that if you're partnering with an academic institution, which many SBIR companies are, that, can, that academic institution can only take up up to a third of the cost. Whereas with STTR, it is more flexible. So a minimum for STTR, a minimum of 40% of the cost um, must be met by the small business. And a single partnering research institution must uh, represent at least 30% of the cost. And then the last 30% can be split between either of those two or another research partner. Um, the other difference is that with STTR, the PI can be at the university. However, with SBIR, you could do a multi-PI where one of the PIs is at the university. So there's still some flexibility there. You know, I think before you apply, it sometimes makes sense to talk to the institute. And it, that's going to be my take home today is that you really want to talk to us before you apply. Um, but, you know, in terms of SBIR and STTR, because STTR is a smaller overall pool of money, we do tend to get less applications. But that means the fluctuation in our funding rates from STTR can vary pretty significantly from year to year. So when you're applying, we may know, um, you know, if this is a year where we have a lot of non-competing money from previous awards that are tied up in STTR and the budget's going to be very tight. At NIA, unfortunately, we're in that situation this year. Or if it's a year that's more the opposite and we'll have more money for STTR than usual. So definitely be in touch with the Institute on those types of things. Um, I know Matt showed you the phase slide, so I won't go over it any further. Um, I do want to talk about budgets. Um, hopefully, by this point in the conference, you're all going to get these questions correct. Um, so I'm going to um, throw out numbers and raise your hand if you think this is the budget limit for an NIH SBIR phase one. Uh, who says 150,000? Nice, I love this. Who says 225,000? All right, we still got some work to do then. We still got some work to do. All right. Um, so in reality, it, um, it is 225,000 for those projects that are not covered by a waiver with SBA. If you look at the list of projects that are covered by the SBA, I would guess that almost everyone, if not every person in this room, has a project that is covered by a waiver by the SBA. So um, in reality, you know, what you really need to look at, when you look at the omnibus, there's a link to a separate companion document called Research Topic Narratives um, by Institute or something along those lines. Um, in that section, each institute will tell you what their budget maximum is 
for projects that are covered by the waiver. And, uh, several institutes use $300,000 for phase one and $2 million for phase two. That's about seven or eight institutes use those numbers. So definitely look at what the numbers for each institute are before you apply. And for some institutes, they actually don't put a limit. Um, now in terms of the specifics of the budget, so um, all the numbers that I just talked about are all total costs. Um, and they do include the 7% fee. You should get in the habit of always asking for that 7% fee. It's the only money you can ask for the NIH without explaining how you're going to use it. Um, so it often becomes helpful for costs that we generally don't pay for. Um, and then the other thing to mention is this whole question about, all right, well, two thirds of the work in an SBIR has to be done by the company. So what does that mean? It, most institutes will, and really, again, it's an institute by institute thing, so you should check with them. But most institutes in the NIH would follow the interpretation that if you are farming something out to a COO and it's a commercially available assay, um, you are doing any specialized design, you're sending them, let's say, an agent or a sample, whatever it is, they are putting it through their screen, they are sending you back the data, you're doing all the analysis. In that case, most institutes would count that as a small business cost. You're basically buying a service as a supply. Um, so that could count as part of the small business two-thirds. Now that means it's billed on a fee per basis, so that partner is not taking indirect costs or anything like that. They're just charging you a fee per basis. Um, and then you can include it. Now you still, that can't be everything. You, your company shouldn't be fully virtual per the congressional language around SBIR, but that can make up some some or good amount of your, your two-thirds. So don't really talk to us about your specific project to get more detailed than that. Um, I, I think Matt might have mentioned this, that we now have the ability, you now have the ability for phase two to request up to $50,000 in technical assistance and $6,500 per year um, in phase one. Um, so another thing that you can take advantage of. So in terms of funding mechanisms, um, you probably heard the omnibus now many times. That is where the NIH spends most of its SBIR funds. It is investigator initiated. We do reserve a lot of our money for that purpose. Uh, however, several institutes do use targeted solicitations. Some institutes do it through contracts. Some do it through other grant funding opportunities. And of course, some do it through a mix of both. Application cycles, um, so we just missed the one in January. Uh, the next one is in April, the next one is September. Depending when you apply, the length of time it could take to get your award does vary. Um, just based on the calendar, when we get the budget, when the fiscal year ends, things of that nature. So that's an important thing to kind of keep an eye out and we can walk you through that. So I know Matt showed the funding rates. Um, Technical assistance programs that we have in place right now for phase one, the niche assessment program, and for phase two companies, the commercialization accelerator program. Um, so once you're funded, these are things you definitely want to look for. And then, you know, at the NIH wide level, we're really trying to figure out what else we can do for our company. So we've um, incorporated a lot of entrepreneurial development programs like C3I and i um, programs to facilitate partnerships through working with organizations like the Angel Capital Association, BIO, um, RESI. So, you know, all of these things, you know, do exist once you get awarded by the NIH. So I'm now going to shift over to the National Institute on Aging, where I now manage the small business programs. So we created a as you may know, the National Institute of Aging has grown significantly in size. Our SBIR budget actually more than tripled in four years, which is a, a rate of growth that's pretty unprecedented at the NIH. Um, and much of that is due to congressional attention and funding for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we, uh, or they, before they, I got there, decided to establish a new office to really elevate the small business programs at the NIA. And, um, I was asked to come lead that effort. So our office is really going to have six sets of kind of, you know, activities. Um, we will manage, obviously, all the small business programs at the NIA. Um, a big part of it's going to be guidance. You know, I heard Matt's remarks on the peer review process at the NIH. I do not disagree with him at all. Um, you know, it is an inconvenient truth that often the, the best scoring applications at the NIH are not the best projects, they're the best applications. 
Um, so, you know, we try to come to things like this and talk to you on the phone before you apply. And organizations like FreeMind are a good resource, too, to make sure that the quality of your application um, really matches the merits of your technology. Um, because often that, that's where the disconnect occurs, not because you have a bad technology that's not worth developing. Um, so outreach is a big part of that. Funding, networking, connecting companies within our space to the other things going on at the NIA, as well as an in industry. And then I mentioned entrepreneurial training and efforts related to that. So the way NIA is structured, there's four programmatic divisions. Um, there's a division of aging biology, division of behavioral and social research, division of geriatrics and clinical gerontology, and the division of neuroscience. Essentially, each one of these divisions has a small business lead. That small business lead um, and myself and my office will sit together in committee and really together manage the small business programs in a, in a high level way. Um, so through that, we have several funding opportunities. We do use the omnibus as our primary funding opportunity. Um, and I put on each of these slides for each of the funding opportunities what our actual budget limits are for topics that are covered by the waiver, which many of them would be. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is a big focus. The NIA actually, because of this new money for Alzheimer's, about 70% of the NIA's budget just does go specifically to Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, and it's obviously a growing and, and, and already huge problem in the U.S. and internationally. Um, and the National Plan to Address Alzheimer's, you know, says that we really need to effectively treat and prevent Alzheimer's by 2025. Yes? How about heart disease, which is also Yeah, so, you know, I get these questions all the time, and, and it's something that I think the NIA has been evolving. Um, you know, I think you can probably throw out almost, well, not almost, but many of the diseases that the NIH funds um, do occur mostly in older people. Um, heart disease, cancer, um, you know, we, we can go on and on. Um, bladder, kidney, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think really when we think about aging, we want it, if it's a specific type of heart disease where the biology of aging is contribu specifically contributing to the pathogenesis, then it's something we can consider. However, I think since our funding has become tighter, at least for small business, in the non-Alzheimer's activities, we are focused a little more on funding things where there's not another institute at the NIH that can fund it, just in fairness to the overall community. Um, so an, an example is fall prevention, where we're really one of the only institutes that has a heavy area in that, versus if it is heart disease, then HLBI can be a funder, obviously, of heart disease. So it's something we can talk to and something that kind of comes down to how much funding we have available, um, but you know, something we consider. Um, so the um, other funding opportunities we have, we have a number that are just related to Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. The largest, where we get about 30% of our funds, is this um, parent Alzheimer's funding opportunity that can include prevention, diagnosis, treatment, behavioral and social research, mobile technologies, um, devices. Um, and for that funding opportunity, we actually just announced new budget limits of 450,000 for phase one and 2.5 million for phase two. So higher than what you usually see at the NIH, although there are some that are even higher. Um, we have one on testing lifespan, health span extension interventions, one on technology to detect and monitor assess daily functions in individuals with cognitive decline, tools for clinical care and management of AD. And then we have two that are very related that are assistive technologies, being more specific, development of socially assistive robots. And then we have two translational research funding opportunities. Um, and then we just announced a new RFA on cellular resiliencies. Um, and if you're interested, definitely contact me. We have a webinar coming up on that. So I now want to shift over to the application itself. Are there any general questions before I do that? Yes. Digital 
Yeah, so most of the digital health projects will fall within the division of behavioral and social research. And that is actually a significant part of our small business opportunities as well. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have the exact numbers of how much, you know, what percentage of our budget, but I can say it's pretty sizable. I think probably more than most institutes, um, in my experience, uh, for digital health, because it is such a, a need, you know, in terms of things. One of the things that we pay particular attention to is the caregiver population. Um, and, you know, digital health tools that ha can help connect caregivers and educate caregivers and things of that nature. So that's a place where we do have a, a, a focus. Yes? If, if uh, we are not sure which institute would be interested, so do you have like a database with <coughs> all the brands? Yeah, so we have um, one on one tables over in that room, and on, the, um, on Dr. Matt Portnoy's table, he actually has a sheet of the contacts for each institute, so who the right person is to contact for each institute. What I, w I mean, you can definitely look at, at a high level, the mission statement on the website of every institute, but what I would really, for those that you think might be a fit, I would send the specific games page, and I'll explain what that means in a second, um, to those contacts and ask them to give you their, you know, to have a call with you, to give you guidance and tell you if you, they think it fits their institute. Um, you know, that's what we're here for. So, so feel free to go get that flyer on um, Matt Portnoy's table in the other room. So um, in terms of what NIH specifically, and I would say this is really NIH wide, what NIH is looking for, obviously innovative solutions to significant unmet clinical needs. There does need to be a significant commercial potential. Now that's different from saying a high financial return on investment. So we, we understand that we can, as the NIH, focus on you know, health benefit as a primary factor. So there are things where it might have commercial potential, but might not be a blockbuster in terms of dollar revenue numbers, but would really help patients in the long term or help research. And, and we can take that into account, which you know, a pure financial investor may not be able to take that into account. Um, and we encourage both startup companies that are too early for private investment. That represents the vast majority who we fund. But it's also possible for established small businesses that are seeking to pursue new projects. Um, so I mentioned time already, both the time that it takes to put together a competitive application, as well as the time it takes from once you submit to getting the award, which is usually about six to nine months, much better than it used to be a few years ago. Um, but it's not urgent cash. Um, you know, you do need to show why you're better. It is small business innovation research. So part of really developing a competitive application is show why your solution is likely, if the data works out, to be unique and better than the existing solutions on the market. Um, and that's a case you really have to make. Um, now, if it's incremental innovation, innovation, there are times where that could be okay. Um, but it, it depends on the significance of that increment. You know, sometimes an incremental innovation can be super significant. So we get that, it really comes down to specifics. And those are the types of things we can talk to you when you send us that AIMS page, which I am about to get into. So um, on to the application itself, um, developing the first draft. Um, something you really want to do, so if you're thinking about the April 5th deadline, once you get back to offices, that's about the right time to start developing that first draft. It does take that long. Um, you know, consider your company's strengths, how you can take advantage of those in the application and the project. Consider the company's weaknesses, how to address them. And I always tell people, identify the key question to be addressed. So if, if you tell your elevator pitch to you know, four or five people today, and three of them ask you the same question, um, you want to do one of two things. Ideally, you want to have some initial answer to that question before you apply for the phase one. But at minimum, if that, if that question really takes a significant amount of money to answer, then you want to make sure you're addressing that question in the phase one. Because when we look at it as program staff and even reviewers, one of the things that's in our heads, especially on the program side, is at the end of this phase one, will they have the answers they need to have to tell us if we should be funding a phase two. So if, you, if there is really a key question and you're not addressing that at the time of the phase one, 
then that's going to give us pause about funding the phase one, because then it's like, well, we won't really know what we need to know after we spend this $300,000 anyway. So that you know, is a concern to us and often prevents, can prevent us from funding. So think about that and make sure you address that early on. Um, as I said, please contact us at least a month before. We unfortunately, you know, can't handle a thousand requests the week before the deadline. So that's why we always tell people to come in early. But if you do, you know, we will review your AIMS page. We'll schedule a call and really give you constructive feedback. And, you know, the NIH Reporter is a great database. It includes the abstracts and the contact information and budgets for anything that has already been funded by the NIH. So several reasons to use that. One is competitive intelligence. You know, if, if you're coming in with, with a solution, there's a good chance that other companies are, you know, working against the same target or the same problem. So see what the NIH has already awarded in that space so you can make sure that you position yourselves in the right way. It could also sometimes be used for collaborators. If you're a small business that's, you know, in engineering and now trying to move an engineering device to life sciences and you want to see who are local investigators that you could partner with, you can use the, the database for that purpose as well. The National Institute on Allergy and Infectious Diseases has sample applications available on their website. It's a tremendous resource, I think really helpful. These are applications that were actually awarded um, and the applicants agreed to let us make the applications public. So, you know, they, they really are projects that show you how to write and how to be competitive. The SF424 um, is the application guide. It, it is over 100 pages, but it is extremely worth uh, reading and looking at as you fill out all of the different forms. And the NIH Assist platform is also extremely helpful when you're actually ready to do the application. In terms of institute and study section, so it used to be that you put these requests in a cover letter, then there is now a PHS assignment request form that's one of the application forms where you would request both which institute and which study section you would like. Um, and you can find all the study sections online. By the way, I didn't say this, but my, both the slides and the presentation will be available on the FreeMind website. Um, so you should have all of these links um, available to you. Um, so on the CSR website, you can see all the NIH SBR study sections. And if you'd like, you can request a specific study section. They don't honor it unless, one, they, they agree that they would have made the same determination. Or you, you propose a really strong rationale for why that study section has a specific type of expertise that is needed to fully understand your application that other study sections don't. So if you are going to request a study section, don't just request it. Make sure you really justify that, that part of it. Um, so I mentioned starting early, um, you know, making sure first you find the right funding uh, opportunity to apply to. Um, you know, obtaining letters of support, as you know, that can take time. So, you know, start those conversations early. Um, and then the administrative requirements. So if you haven't applied for NIH SBR funding yet, there's a great on the sbr.nih.gov page. There's a, I think it's yellow if I remember correctly. It says uh, new to SBIR, click here. And if you click there, it, there's a nice infographic that walks you through all of the registrations required to apply for an NIH SBR award. In totality, those can take a couple months. So if you're, you haven't applied and you haven't done those, make sure to start those now before April 5th. Because um, if, if even one of those is not done, we usually cannot accept the application. You have to wait till the next de deadline, which in this case would be September 5th. So you want to make sure you have that all before you have to submit your application. So you know, remember to focus on the project product. That's a key difference between academic grant and SBIR. With an academic grant, you really focused on the science. But with a SBIR grant, you are focused on the product. And obviously, science is a part of what's going to get you to that product, but it's not everything. And make sure that you think about the other factors. And you really pay attention to them and give them the right landscape they need in the application. Um, refining your vision. You know, seek help from others that have experience. Um, you know, I always tell people, I mean, you all have friends, and if you have, you know, friends in the field, I think you can all tell me if I asked you who's the one person that, you know, you sometimes talk science with, it's just always so critical. Um, 
make sure you actually show that person your application. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to have three reviewers. One of those reviewers is going to think exactly like that person. And, that one, and you've all seen this, right? And that one reviewer is going to give you six and sevens, and the others are going to give you twos and threes. So try to figure out you know, how to address someone that thinks in that way and those tough concerns. Because likelihood is you're going to have at least one reviewer that thinks along those lines. Um, building the right team, um, you know, selecting a principal investigator with the right expertise is a good start. However, usually when it comes down to the team score, it's not primarily based on the PI um, for an NIH application. It's based on whatever's missing. And it's usually something small, well, you may see it as small, but reviewers don't, that you, know, you could have addressed if you had a consultant for a small number of hours. A perfect example that I see in tons of summary statements is biostatisticians. So if you are doing animal studies, okay, and you don't show that your team will in some way, shape, or form include a biostatistician, you will likely get a comment and a weakness um, and a ding in your score that you don't have the right biostatistician, biostatistics expertise to do the right power calculations for your animal studies. Now, if you would have taken um, found a consultant and gotten a letter of support that has that expertise and maybe assigned them five hours as an example, um, you know, to uh, work on an hourly basis to do the power calculations, you wouldn't have had that concern. Pretty easy fix. So think about that. Think about all the, you know, what are you doing in your project and what are all the little types of expertise you need and then see how you can address them within the team. That doesn't mean hiring a 10-person team. Okay, but that does mean think about collaborators, think about consultants, and how you can fill those gaps. So I mentioned a, a number of times already the specific games page. Um, you know, it really is a score driving page of the application, and essentially the executive summary of an application. So, you know, what I always tell people is, you know, the specific games page on its own should be able to tell a reviewer. If the NIH gets 1,000 applications a year, which it does, why is this the one that they should score the best? Okay, that's how you want to think about your specific games page. Um, so the first half to two-thirds of the page is that elevator pitch. Why is it most important? Why is it most meritorious? It's going to include um, describing the unmet need that you're trying to address. It's going to include textual highlights of the preliminary data. So, in a pilot study, we shown tumor, you know, 80% tumor regression. You know, the rest of your application, you're going to include the graphs and the exact data and everything else. But putting a sentence like that is really going to grab the ooh, This is really interesting. You know, so you want to do that. You want to make that first impression. Um, and then, how will it change the paradigm? In many cases, so if it's going to be a clinical product, how will it change the clinical paradigm? If it's a research tool, how will it change the research paradigm? Um, and then the last third to half a page will be the aims for the project, uh, including you know, key models, assays, and metrics, and quantitative performance milestones at a high level. So this is where you know, what I always suggest to people, because this does serve as such a good summary, I found over the years it's really the best page that I could ask you to send me where I can, you know, give you real specific guidance of, you know, you don't address it here, which is okay, but you make sure your application talks about X or talks, to, you know, and talks about Y. So really that's what I suggest is to send the NIH staff that page. Develop that page first, send that to them at least a month before the deadline, and then they can have a call with you to, to provide that type of guidance. So, um, you know, drafting a clear application, you know, remember to address all of the review criteria, provide the background information, a technical plan. You know, team and approach are really the, the two sections where most of the weaknesses tend to come from. Um, so make sure you pay part particular attention to both of those sections um, and both of those criteria. Um, describing potential pitfalls and alternative angles of attack. If you don't, I can bet anything that the reviewers will say that in your summary statement and ding your score for it. Um, happens all the time, so please make sure you have a section for potential pitfalls. Um, 
And then some of the other things that NIH has come out with rec uh, more recently, like uh, validation of specific reagents, um, a number of others that you know you really have to have, and then also things like vertebrate animal sections and things of that nature. Um, other application components: so letters of support. So what is required is letters of support from anyone that is uh, getting money from the grant. So if you suggest you know CROs in your budget or collaborators or consultants. Make sure you have a letter from them stating that they're agreeing to do what you're saying they're going to do for the price that you're saying they're going to do it at. Um, all that's required. Um, but what's most helpful on top of that is letters from someone that's not making any money off your application if it gets awarded. Um, so key opinion leaders, potential investors, you know, people that don't necessarily have a stake in the game but still spend the time to write a letter saying how great they think that your technology and application is. Um, those letters can, can make a huge difference. So the SBR review criteria, um, you know, as Matt said, um, these will likely undergo some changes in the next several months to a year or two. Um, it does take time within the government, unfortunately, to make some changes. Um, but they, they are coming. Um, you know, right now, the, these are the definitions, and, and we try to have reviewers interpret them in the best way possible. Um, but we will work on, on changing some of these so they're really focused on small business and commercialization and what makes sense. But make sure to pay attention to each of these. You know, I mentioned sending your application to others, conducting your own peer review. Um, don't try to hide potential pit pitfalls. Adjust them up front and suggest strategies to overcome them. Um, and then select feedback from independent readers. You know, also, I mean, everyone has a different definition of layperson, but um, the review panels tend to be quite uh, wide in, in breadth. So, you know, it, it's not necessarily that you want to, that you need to send it to someone that has never touched science in their life, but you want to maybe send it to someone in a different field of biology than you are, because the review panels are going to include multiple fields. So, you know, if you're doing a therapeutic, you're likely in a review panel that's going to have small molecules and biologics. And so don't just send it, let's say you have a protein peptide. Don't, don't just send it to people in the peptide field. Send it to a small molecule person as well, because you're going to have those small molecule reviewers. So they're going to think along those lines. So think about that and, and that breadth that you need. And again, when you go to the link I talked about earlier with the study sections, you can see all of the reviewers from the past study sections. Actually, 30 days before your application is reviewed, you'll see the set of reviewers for your specific. But at that point, it's too late. So just look at the past rosters and look at that breadth and make sure that when you're conducting your own peer review, you're matching that breadth. Um, one of the things a little bit unique to SBR versus some of the other NIH funding mechanisms is that unscored applications obviously still happen about 50% of the time. But with SBIR, it's not a death knell. Um, you know, every day we're funding projects that the first submission got an unscored and they resubmitted. Uh, again, a lot of times it's not that they didn't have a good project and that's why they weren't scored. It's that they didn't put the right things in their application and they didn't frame something in the right way. So that resubmission can make a world of difference. Um, so definitely, you know, talk to us, you know, to see if we think you should resubmit and, and you know, take that encouragement if we give it. Um, I always say when you get that, you know, a lot of people will call us right when they get their score. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can tell you at that time. Um, but once you get that summary statement, I always suggest to people draft that response to the reviewers, send that to us, and then let's have a call. Because then it's a lot easier for me to, tell you, to see your perspective of how you actually address these concerns to then answer the question that I know you're going to ask me, which is, will a resubmission be any more competitive? I don't know if I can see how you're going to address the concerns. So you know, send that to them, to the program officer. And that really helps for more constructive conversation. Of course, with the reviewers and your response, be constructive, not defensive. Um, you know, it, people never, I mean, human nature, right? They never like to see someone tell them that they were wrong and they didn't read something. 
you know. So if you, you know, I, I know, but if you just have lots of applications, they miss a lot of things. So, you know, if you had a biostatistician, going with that example, in your application, and then you get a comment saying that you didn't have any biostatistics expertise on your team. You know, the, the right way to respond to that is not, it was on page six and you didn't read it. The right way to respond is, I now clarified that we do have tremendous biostatistics expertise. Please see page seven of this revised application. You're gonna do a lot better that way, trust me. Um, so, and I know the other way is more tempting. I know it seems more satisfying in the moment that you're writing that application, but think long term. So, um, application resources, um, I mentioned the sample applications. On the SBR NIH website, there's an annotated form set that really walks through each of the forms. That's really helpful. Um, I mentioned the infographic. Our website is linked to here. I mentioned reporter for NIA. We have some animal models and other things on our website that may be helpful. Um, here's our website. You can stay up to date um, through the NIA blog. A little teaser, if you do that, um, there's a blog post coming in the next few weeks from yours truly, so hopefully you enjoy that. And feel free to email me. Questions? Go ahead. Submit new materials after you submitted your application, new information? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, um, Matt, are you here? Oh, is, oh, oh, Christine Dunsmore, are you here? Um, no, my NIH backups aren't here for that question. So, um, I always get confused. There's, there's two periods. There's one, um, there's one for the um, time between the first submission and the resubmission. And then there's one between the um, phase one and the phase two. One of them is two years. One of them is six cycles. If you think about three cycles a year, they're really kind of the same thing. So the short answer is about two years is the time. However, if you need more, if let's say it, you, know, you need to really get more data and it took time to get additional data, then contact us. We can give you an extension. That is something that we can be flexible on. Um, so remember, you know, again, the key message being contact us. Um, additional questions? Someone asked a question, so I keep going, because otherwise I'm going to stop. Yes? What percentage of grants are typically getting funded? Yeah, so I think Matt Portnoy did, uh, showed that slide. Um, it's about, for phase one, it's about 20% on average. Um, again, I don't have the slide in front of me, but something like that. Um, give or take a couple percentage points. And for phase twos, it's more like 40%. Again, because phase two, two now these are traditional phase twos, not direct to phase twos, uh, because they have been reviewed at the phase one stage. So it's already a smaller uh, overall pool. So for the, I'm a digital professor, keep asking about that. Um, for digital, how much of the funding that you're getting Well, I mean, so again, remember, that, you know, phase one, phase two, I mean, it's how you define them. There's no relation to obviously clinical phases. You know, we find in most of digital health, you often do need both phases. You know, sometimes it's not, so for a therapeutics or a diagnostics, you know, you need the phases of research to get that investor and, and, and get to market. Sometimes with digital health, yeah, you might technically get to market after phase one, but the challenge is penetrating the market. So sometimes that phase two could be really useful to do you know, user groups, additional validation studies, and you know, additional data that will allow you to actually penetrate the market as opposed to just getting it on the market. So that's another way to think about it for digital health. Yeah. Yeah, so the NIAID has a, um, about seven or eight sample applications that were awarded, so they were successful. And you can see the whole application. I mean, small things are redacted, but it, not, not so much that it would prevent you from getting the scope.
I'll stay, even if there's no more questions, I'll, I'll finish that. <laughs> Until 2 o'clock. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just saw that we should not test the qualifications uh, on the previous slide. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the key part of that is why not? You know, if it's just, oh, that looks cool, maybe I could do it. You're not going to want to invest three months of your time as, ooh, that looks cool, maybe I could do it. You know, so you want to um, really make sure that your product fits, you know, and then that's the right thing for your company because it, it is a big investment on your part as well. Yes? Um, you also Sorry. Oh. That there are other kinds of that are based. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so the, a couple of places. One, if you subscribe to the NIH guide, all applications will come. If you just Google NIH guide, you could um, subscribe to that. The SBIR NIH website has a place where you can see all the available funding opportunities. And then pretty much all the institutes on their website, you can see any funding opportunities that they have for their institute. So on the NIA website, we have a specific link. That's all of our funding opportunities. But I guess my question is, what is this doing? Like, for example, you have things like the R01, which is for academics, and very difficult for us. Yeah, no. But these R are they specific to? Small business. So everything, yeah. So the NIH SBIR website will have just the, they'll have a link to just SBIR funding solicitations and STTR. Um, so specific to, and same thing in the, each institute has a, or most institutes have an SBIR website. So on that SBIR website, you can find the small business funding opportunities. Yes? The for most specific cost, for specific topic versus uh, um, do they have different line? So it could, it depends. Sometimes RFAs may, um, and what's called the PAS. So, Funding opportunities that have set aside funding levels could, um, but um, usually PAs and PARs do not. So it's a little bit of the nomenclature. But um, you know, talk to the institute again would be the it, everything is kind of done on an institute by institute basis. So really, you just have to ask them for the specific PA that you're applying to. Um, this is the most important page of the. Of the Slide in my in my point of view, so um, I will spend a few more seconds on the slide. So, um, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, and as promised, I will continue to play.